All right. Well, thank you to the uh, organizers for letting me give a, a, another talk here at the afternoon's meeting. And, you know, it's good to be back in Oxford and seeing everyone again. And I apologize for the rather vague, vague title I sent in months ago. And probably the, uh, you know, the, the I'm happy to talk about the specific project is what we call Redox Reporter Licking Competition in the Cocaine Binding Aftermer EAB Biosensor. A rather wordy title, but that's okay. So just as introduction to uh, you know, those of you who uh, haven't seen me speak here before. Now, what I do in my lab is study how aftermers function and study the structure of aftermers. I'm not involved in selects. I don't try and develop biosensors. It's sort of a basic, uh, basic try to find out structure function relationships with a focus on small molecule binding DNA aftermers. So structure function on small molecule DNA binding aftermers. And for those regular attendees of the meeting, they'll know that I've speak, spoken quite a few times over the years on the cocaine binding aftermer. It really has been a, a great source of uh, projects in my lab. I've also talked about the ATP DNA aftermer, the ochotoxin A aftermer last year. Um, so now I do vary a little bit. And I'll just point out that you know, the methods we use, we study binding using isothermal titration calorimetry, uh, study folding of DNA and comparing free and bound, using differential scanning calorimetry, using fluorescence techniques. And our technique to study aptamer structure, as well as some dynamics, is using NMR spectroscopy. So I said, over the years, our molecule of choice has been the cocaine binding aptamer. It's been a really interesting aptamer in a couple of ways. So, you know, one important way is that it really is not specific for cocaine, but binds quinine 50 fold tighter. It's a whole world full of quinine analogs, mefloquine, amodiaquin, and there's a lot of other quinine based molecules which the cocaine binding also, act, also binds. And the cocaine binding aftermer has also been a model system for the development of these electrochemical aftermer based biosensors. And no, I just told you I don't develop biosensors, but I've had a really good collaborative project with Phil, uh, Phil Philippe Dauphin, Dauphin de Charme in Sherbrooke. And we've had a really you know, fruitful collaboration the past couple of years. Phil's from uh, Kevin Plaxco's lab, he did his postdoc uh, with Kevin. And that's, this is where these EAB sensors were originally developed. And I think it was Rob Batchelor who gave a talk last year here at the meeting as outlined of what this company does in putting uh, these EAB sensors on patches you can put on your skin and then monitor you know, in live stream levels of you know, whatever the acne bonds, antibiotics, anti-cancer drugs, whatever the app, get an aptamer to buy. So these aptamers work as EAB sensors by you know, attaching the aptamer to a gold surface. On one end, you can uh, have a thio on your five prime end, attach the aptamer, and at the three prime end, you can have a redox supporter. And the idea is you know, C in this case stands for cocaine, uh, the cocaine can come and bind your aptamer and we have a structure switching event that takes place with your aptamer and the, when it's free, being poorly structured to when it's ligand bound, becoming more tightly structured. And then the redox reporter gets closer to the surface and you can detect some sort of electrochemical signal. And uh, the redox reporter that is commonly used is methylene blue. Uh, chemical structures shown here. And this gets, this is the R group uh, that gets attached to the three prime end. And well, what Phil noticed was that for the cocaine binding aptamer, the signal in EAB sensors is much greater. We get a 3,000 fold, well, not 3,000 fold, 3,000% signal change 
over using other redox recorders such as ferrocene. And you know, this is what Phil was interested in uh, looking at, and I have been interested in looking at the cocaine binding aftermath. So it was you know, natural for us to, to work together. And the first thing we wondered was, does methylene blue just, you know, does the methylene blue bind the cocaine binding aftermath? And is the displacement of methylene blue by the ligand the source of methylene blue working much better than other redox supporters? Not surprisingly, the answer is going to be yes. So this mechanism of folding on the surface was, you know, it was, made sense because in solution, the cocaine binding aftermath, there's, we've studied a number of variants of the cocaine binding aftermath and what we call MN19 has three base pairs in step one, a uh, different version, jump around, this MN4 version with six base pairs in stem one is pre-folded. If you trim off three base pairs in stem one, you have a uh, in the free state. Uh, different different techniques you'd use to look at the aftermath show that it's either unfolded, partly folded, highly dynamic. You know, it's hard to describe, you know, hard to determine which of those ones are there, but it's certainly a much more dynamic molecule that upon ligand binding folds up into a more tightly bound structure. So, you know, this is a model system for what we refer to as ligand induced folding, of going from a loosely folded structure to a tightly folded bound structure. So the first thing we did was just to see if methylene blue can bind the MN19 aftermer. And the binding, I don't have an introductory slide for, IC, for ITC, but these are different ITC thermograms. And what's you know, the one on the left here is just plain MN19, titrating in methylene blue. And what we get actually are two binding events. And we've seen two binding events, we looked at the ATP binding aftermer, we looked at, I talked one year about two binding events in low sodium chloride conditions for the cocaine binding aftermer. And so we've seen these type of curves before. In the past, we could fit, uh, you know, could fit the binding data to you know, get KD and delta H values for both binding events. Unfortunately, we weren't able to fit the data for the two binding sites, but clearly you get one binding site occurring and a weaker binding site occurring where the weaker binding site is more exothermic than the first binding event. Um, and this is what we've seen previously with the cocaine binding aftermers, as I mentioned. So we, so the answer is yes, methane blue does bind the MN19. And in fact, two binding events occur. If we then take the MN, MN19 bound to methylene blue, add in cocaine, we can then see a, well, we see a single binding event where the cocaine displaces the methylene blue indicating that we think the binding site for both the methylene blue and the ligand is the same place. We also looked at a control sequence for the cocaine binding that we call SS1. And essentially what we did is the cocaine binding aftermer has two AG base pairs and we flipped them around to be GA base pairs. So we have an AG swap to a GA in both of these that are right at the three-way junction, right where the ligand high affinity ligand binding site is. And for cocaine, quinine, and a lot of other ligands that bind the aftermer, this eliminates binding. And indeed, in this case, when we looked at this control sequence, added methylene blue, and we don't see any binding events taking place. Previously, we had seen two binding events. In this case, we see no binding events, you know, indicating and confirming that what we're having is methylene blue binding, binding site, the, the ligand, the cocaine slash quinine binding site. And we don't think what we have occurring is random interpolation of methylene blue. We also as did some uh, NMR because I really enjoy doing NMR and that's what our lab does. So why would we not do it? And we looked at the aftermer of binding methylene blue using NMR techniques. And I'm not gonna show a lot of spectra 
what I do and what I've shown in previous years are these 1D proton NMR spectra where we're in the downfield region in the NMR, uh, NMR spectrum around 14 to 10 ppms. And what we're looking at are the amino protons in base pairs. So each watson crick base pair, had a, you know, a CG or an AT, has an amino proton box here in red. And when that amino proton is taken up in a base pair, it's projected from hydrogen exchange and it's visible, in the NMR spectrum, the two AG base pairs, you know, they are also protected and they're more upfields. So that downfield region, that's the Watson Crick region, that a more upfield region where there's non Watson Crick base pairs occurring. And, uh, you know, the, what I'll just say is that this is the titrating in to free MN19, titrating in methylene blue. And what we see really is similar spectra as what we get with cocaine binding and quinine binding. We have this really diagnostic peak from G31 that appears somewhere in between the watson crick region and the non watson crick region. And you know, 31 is, is right by the ligand binding site. And we think it has unusual chemical shift just because it's close to, close to the newly bound ligand. And the thing to look at for MN19 is we go from a free state, and I said it's poorly structured, and you know, what we get are broad peaks, low intensity, and we don't see all the peaks we would see that we would expect to see based on the secondary structure. But once we've added in ligand, and we see the two peaks from the GAs, we see the G31. So you know, the structure here, we, you know, what comes in with ligand binding are the signals from stem one, as well as a GA mismatch. So what we have, the NMR with methylene blue binding is also consistent with ligand binding and binding, folding the aptomer, as you'd expect from an EAB biosensor, it's supposed to bind, well, the ligand is supposed to bind and fold the aptomer. So of course in the EAB biosensor, what there is, is a methylene blue molecule attached to the three prime end. So what we then did was pay the big bucks and get a large scale synthesis of the methylene blue labeled DNA on the micromole scale and looked at the NMR spectrum of this construct. So, you know, let's just drew it schematically here. We have the methylene blue, not really drawn to scale. There's, a, the, there's six CH2 groups linking the methylene blue and the aptamer, but there's also other stuff. Like and what we did is looked at the NMR spectrum of this conjugated MN19 and compared to what we saw with the unbound aptamer as well as the methylene blue bound aptamer. And that's the spectrum. So on the top here is the unbound, unconjugated MN19. On the bottom is the MN19 bound to methylene blue and the methylene blue is added in. It's a separate molecule. And in between is the 1D NMR spectrum of methylene blue conjugated to MN19. And we don't really need to look at a whole lot uh, to see that the spectrum of the conjugated MN19 more closely resembles that of the methylene blue MN19 than it does the free MN19. Now we see in the conjugated spectrum, the uh, two peaks from the GAs, now they're hidden under uh, my, my cartoon here, but the two GAs are shown here. We have G31 coming up. It's, you know, it's hard to say we might have two signals from G31, maybe the methylene blues binding in two slightly different conformations. We don't know exactly what's going on. Interestingly enough, we see G4, which is the terminal base pair that we don't see in the unconjugated, but maybe you know, with conjugation, breathing motions at the terminal base pair are now settled down. And a lot of peaks similar, uh, that are similar in the two spectrum are the peaks that are in stem two as well as stem three. So now what we've shown here that the methylene blue conjugated MN19 binds and folds the cocaine binding aptamer. We could then take some of the sample from the NMR tube and run ITC on it and add cocaine 
to the methylene blue conjugated aptamer. And what we see is a binding event. So you know, if we then add cocaine, the MN19 conjugated methylene blue, you know, bound methylene blue, then become, we believe it dis is displaced by the cocaine. So that you know, cocaine is bound, the methylene blue gets displaced. So addition of cocaine to the methylene blue conjugated aptamer displaces the methylene blue and cocaine can still bind. And this is really what we think is going on at the core of the EAB sensor. So you know, this is where the title of the talk came from, where we think at least for the cocaine binding aptamer, you know, these EAB sensors have been shown to work with a lot of different aptamers, aptamer small molecule combinations. And you know, the question you know, was always out there is, why is the cocaine binding aptamer give such a good signal response compared to a lot of the other aptamers? And we think that at least for the cocaine binding aptamer, this is because the methylene blue binds at binding site. Ligand displaces the methylene blue, and that gives a strong signal, uh, a much stronger signal than what you would get if it was going from a ligand-induced folding mechanism. Now, of course, other aptamers may, uh, as EAB sensors, may proceed by a ligand-induced folding mechanism. Now, what we're doing now is you know, seeing at this mechanism how true it is, how universal it is, if at all, amongst EAB biosensors and looking at different, ap different aptamers that work as EAB biosensors and see how they blind methods and see the similar results here. And I'm happy to say that, you know, as of yesterday, our paper finally got accepted. And uh, so it's not, I thought I'd be presenting uh, unpublished data, but I would, would be yesterday, uh, that is published today. So I'd just like to finish by thanking everyone in my lab. Uh, the people at talk here, Zach, Megan, Rahi, Emily, and Kavasan are all present at the meeting here and have posters that I encourage you to come and see. And uh, as mentioned, Aaron and Sajana who worked on this project, who have now moved on. And of course, couldn't have done this without uh, you know, working with Phil, uh, Phil and Shirley. So thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions.